Babe, as that modern spiritual philosopher Pat Benatar said, love is a battlefield. I mean, I don't really know so much about love, but marriage is a battlefield. And that's what we're talking about uh, right now on Marriage by Design. But today specifically, we're going to talk about in order to fight a battle on a battlefield, you got to know who's your friends and who's your enemies. Well, let's get into that right now. Hey everybody, I'm Nathan Warnock. I'm Andrea Warnock, and you've joined us for Marriage Monday on the Marriage by Design podcast, and this is a time where we get to talk to you about God's design for marriage and how we live that out practically. That's right. So we have kind of started to bring season two to a close, and we're, we're leaving season two with a short series on love and marriage. Love. Oh, that's sorry. Andrew, that's that's sorry. Andrea's ringtone, by the way. Mm, on yes, phone. on Nathan's phone. I have this terrible habit that my mom had when I was younger, and it drove me nuts when I was younger, but now I do it where people say something and a song just pops in my head, right. <laughs> and sometimes right. I sing it. That's right. Okay, anyway. So the series is called This is War, and it's basically being honest about what marriage is, and the reality of the matter is marriage is war, but so often society paints it as war between husband and wife, but what it really is is war between husband and wife as a married couple, and Satan, right, our enemy. And so uh, what we're going to talk about today, uh, our last episode we talked about just generally what it means that love is war. Now we're going to talk that marriage is war. Now we're going to talk about something specific, and we've entitled this episode, Show Me Your Friends, I'll Show Your Marriage Its Future. Because what I said in the intro is really so true in marriage that in order to fight this battle that is marriage against our common enemy, you have to know who your friends are and who your enemies are. Now we've talked about, and we'll we'll complete talking about this next week in our final episode, about our ultimate enemy, right? We talked about last week in, uh, what is it, uh, Ephesians, that talks about our our enemy is not of flesh and blood, but, you know, a a spiritual force uh, that's seeking to to, to devour us and seeking to devour our marriages. But also, if we're honest, some of our best friends might be enemies with (gasps) regards to Our our marriages. And... Uh, that might strike you as like, oh, that's that. I don't like the way that sounds, and that's fine. But I'm not saying all of our friends are bad people. I'm just saying, you know, look at here's the right out of the matter. I've got a number of guy friends that I like a lot, <clears throat> and we do a lot of fun stuff together. We golf, and we you know play board games and video games, and and just hang out as guys. I have one specific guy friend who was a marine and he thinks all things marine right that's his deal his passion is the marine corps and all things marines if i knew someone was attacking my home love all those friends not inviting all of them to come help me in that situation i'm inviting the one who i know can most protect me in that moment Mm -hmm. Right? It's the same way in marriage. We're not saying friends you have that maybe are unmarried or maybe they've you know, gone through a divorce and so they're jaded on marriage as a thing or maybe they just don't know and so they're just like, well, whatever, it's just marriage. I'm not saying those are bad people or bad friends. What I'm saying is we need to identify when the devil attacks our marriage, who are we going to go to to fight alongside us through that battle and those friends might not be the best people for that yep all right so let's dive into this today so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what the bible says about um, friendship and and allies really in general and then uh, i want to transition a little bit and along the way we'll tell you some stories about us and how friends have really helped us uh, over the years in our marriage Uh, but 
then we're going to transition just a little bit to, to kind of comment on something I just commented about, about, uh, you know, being choosy about who we go to really for speaking into our marriage and how important and, and careful we need to be in that regard. Then we're going to talk about a couple of practical things, right? For you as a husband or you as a wife, or perhaps you as a couple that's engaged and you're going to be a husband or wife, or maybe you're just watching this channel and someday you may be called to marriage. I would encourage you in a couple of practical ways, uh, and we'll talk about those at the end. So the first thing that I wanted to read from the Bible is from Ecclesiastes 4, 7 through 12. Now, if you've ever been to a wedding, odds are you've probably heard this verse, which is ironic for a reason that I'll share here in a moment. So Ecclesiastes 4, 7 starts and it says this. This is uh, Solomon speaking. This is one of the books of poetry that Solomon wrote. And he's kind of reaching the end of his life and he's reflecting back on his life and he's realizing so much of the stuff around us is, he, he uses the word vanity and he says it quite a bit. We're going to hear it again. That, that uh, root uh, Hebrew word for vanity means vapor, right? It's no, nothing lasts, right? He's reaching the end of his life as the most wealthy man ever to live and one of the wisest men ever to live. And yet he's looking around him at the end of his life going, this is, this is vain. This is vapor. It's nothing. Uh, and, and his reflections on that. So here's what he says. Again, I saw vanity under the sun, worthless things under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, For whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This is also vanity and an unhappy business. So what he's saying here is, to, to just go through life alone is, is worthless, it's useless, right? Because you have no one to share this life with. Which, what he's really saying here is these relationships we form, these are lasting, right? These aren't vain things. These are important, these relationships that we form. And then there's the part you've probably heard in weddings. Starting in verse 9, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together to keep warm... But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A, three cord, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Oh, this is um, read quite a bit in weddings, and a lot of times the bride and groom will like be twisting a cord together. There will be a t twisted cord there. And uh, I, kind of, I kind of have to chuckle a little bit because uh, this is talking about how you know, two are better than one. Um, but of course, when you get married, you... Become one. You become one. So it's kind of a funny... It's, it's a cute... Look, I get it. It's a cute picture. And it, and it is two human beings. I understand. But the point for what we're talking about is we're celebrating how, in verse 12, though a man might prevail against one who's alone, two will withstand him. That exact verse actually proves the point we're trying to make today, mm -hmm. which is... When you become married, you become one. So if your plan for marriage is, hey, we're going to get married, and then we're going to hold each other accountable, and we're going to fight this fight, and we don't need other people, we don't really need mentoring, we definitely don't need people asking nosy questions about our marriage, we're just going to do it. And it's, it's going to be great. against the world. That's right. An idea. Yeah. What you've actually done is ran afoul of this exact verse that you probably had at your wedding. Um, because what you're saying is we've become one before the Lord and we're just going to do it on our own. Um, and, of course, that's the exact opposite of what he's saying here in this verse is, you know, two, if for verse 10, for if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. And that's what we're talking about here. I mean, there are times in all of our marriages where we're going to stumble and we're going to struggle. Um, and... Uh, and we've had that even in our own marriage where there have been times when we've struggled and we've had to lean on other people to... Sure, to I mean, out. I can think of a, a time where Nathan and I were at odds with each other and I knew 
I knew what needed to be done on my side and I but I also knew what I wanted to hear from that wasn't godly advice you know so there was there was kind of this these opposing thoughts in my head where it's like I know what I want the world to say and that's what I want to hear but I also know what's right and what I need to do and I called my one of my really good friends who's also been our one of our mentors for the last eight years or whatever and I told her the situation that was happening and I had the right to be angry in the situation and um, and talked to her about it and she told me the things that I needed to hear not what I wanted to hear and again I was going to her knowing I already knew what I, what she was gonna say I already knew what the right thing was to do but I was going to her to hear those because because it was important for me for whatever reason to hear her say those and to be in my corner um, as far as you know you need to do the hard work but also some validation for how I felt um, and that's okay too but never disparaging my husband you know she was n not going to be somebody who was like oh yeah that that's a what what was he thinking or like knocking him down as a person you know and um, and that was a really important moment for me again not what I wanted to hear in my flesh but but just somebody that that could validate the way I was feeling saying yeah that's that's a hard situation that's crappy and I understand how you feel and all that sort of thing but this is what you need to do right and and it was huge for our marriage right right this verse uh Prover a couple of verses from Proverbs. Proverbs fifteen twenty two says, "Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed." And Proverbs eleven fourteen similarly says, "Where there's no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there's safety." So both of these again um, um, verses that are attributed to some of the wisest men uh, ever to live, Solomon being one of them. Uh, the the point here is that. If, if we're not surrounding ourselves with a, a variety of counsel, an abundance of counselors, uh, Proverbs 11 says, then we're not setting ourselves up to succeed. And we just have to be honest about that. So many times we get married and the marriage, our marriage has kind of become this like, like politics and religion, right? It wasn't that that you were never supposed to talk about in polite company yeah. it's like sort of right. becomes that where it's like i'm more likely to tell you how much money i make than i am to talk to you about the state of my marriage mm -hmm. um and in some cases as we'll talk about here in a minute maybe that's okay but in a lot of cases it's not and the problem is people are putting their marriage in this sort of bubble where no one can from the outside can really press you and what's going on press you to be better lift up your marriage certainly there's no doing marriage together right which is an important place where you might have a group of people and it's not even a formal mentoring relationship it's just five or six or seven couples that are in a similar place in life excuse me doing, doing it together yeah doing marriage and parenting and life together yeah that's right that's right and and again i mean it's that both of these say without counsel plans fail a people fall you know whatever the you know whatever the the um you know the situation there but the point is that um i mean if we're trying to just do it on our own the likelihood of us failing in marriage goes up dramatically sure it does i mean uh, it it talked about that a three chord full or a Three-fold cord cannot is not easily broken, and but a a one cord, one-fold cord, is because if you're alone, it's easy for the the enemy to seclude you and right. to just pick you off. Right, right, yeah. right. So, does that mean then that we just have tons of people around us and we just tell everybody about things that are going on in our marriage and sort of pull the audience on? Hmm what they think we ought to be doing. No. So I have two really good friends that I know are 
uh, have the same views of marriage that I do and that are biblical views of marriage. So, like, they believe in divorce is not an option. They believe that uh, divorce is not an option. <laughs> right. You know, that so that, that we it. should always that we should always be working towards a better marriage all the time. You know, it's that not only that divorce can't happen, but that also a stagnant marriage can't happen either. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, they're great friends of mine. And we talk, I'll, I will I will talk to them and my mentor, who's a friend as well, but the three of them. I will talk to them, not in a group really, but um, if there's something going on about the situation. Uh, but I would not talk to, like, all of my friends because we don't need to be airing our dirty laundry to everyone that will listen. Um, and we need to be careful about who we're getting advice from as well. Um, and then the, those three people that I would, that I would talk to, I also wouldn't talk to all of them to get like a, who, who can I get polling the audience? Right. Who can I get the best answer from? All three of them are wonderful, but let's see who I can get really the best answer from. You know, just different situations or whatever. I would talk to different those different ones, but yeah, you have to be careful who you're who you're letting into those really intimate parts of your marriage. Yeah. So talk a little bit about your friends. How did you figure out that these people all have similar well, views one of them, on marriage? I mean, right? One of them was a, our it, uh, our mentor couple who we've become really good friends with that started being our mentor in the hardest parts, the hardest part of our marriage. So we knew them from church and. So that was, so that's a formal, that was right? a formal so, relationship. So yeah. if you're looking for, you know, to, to grow the group of your allies in this, in this war that is marriage, that's one way to do it. Yeah. And you right? know what we did? They didn't, ever, they didn't come to us and say, Hey, we think you need marriage help. Do you want us to help you? They weren't listed somewhere in our church as marriage mentors. What we did is, uh, we were we were massively struggling, and I knew that they were champions for marriage because, and we had been to a Bible study of theirs, a marriage Bible study of theirs, like two years previous, and we didn't know them other than we were in their home and they did a Bible study. Like we had, we didn't have much interaction with them even from that. Right. Um, so even that was the way we came to them was fairly informal. Um, yeah, but, we, but, so we, I just called her up and said, hey, we're struggling and I need help. And, right, but my, my point to take away from this is if you're going, man, I don't really have any friends that I know, we would say go to your church if you're plugged into a church. If you're not, get plugged into a, to yeah. a Bible-believing, uh, God-fearing church and go to the leadership of that church in whatever form that looks like, whether it's elders available to talk after a Sunday service or the pastor or you know, whatever the situation may be, and ask them, like, hey, do you have people within your body that, you have to be um, bold. that are champions for marriage? So that's a formal way to do it, but but you're exactly right. I mean, look, at, if if we were in a trench and people started shooting bullets at us, we'd get pretty bold right. about asking bold. for other people to come join us your in marriage fighting is on the against line. that. Right. Yep. right, so that's one way. That's a pretty formal way. What about some of your other folks? Friends. Some of my other friends I found... Craigslist? Not through Craigslist. eBay. I paid for them. Oh, it's like a sorority. No. Oh. Randomly through church. Most of my friends are through church, but some are some other some other ways. Um But not formally through church, right? I mean we didn't you didn't ask for those right. friends, right? I don't or remember how I don't remember. I feel like making friends is kind of like dating. It's really awkward for a while. You know, when you go on your first few dates and you're trying to figure, you're trying to feel it out and does this work? Are we on the same? Hopefully you're not actually feeling it out. <laughs> I knew actually... you were going to say, in my head, right as I said that, I thought he's totally going to make a comment she knows. about this. She knows about me. Um, are, are we on the same wavelength? Do we get along? All that sort of stuff. I feel like making friends is that. You have to be willing to no. get through the awkwardness of the first few dates. Like, maybe it's the first 20 <laughs> dates. It just is. And then, especially if you've got kids, because you have, like, f- 
you have like one fifth of conversation and then you're pulled away because the kid needs something and then you come back and you try to have your two fifths of the conversation and anyway. Um, so yeah, they just, they happened because maybe we were in Bible study together and we were just like, Hey, you want to hang out sometime? Do you want to actually one of them was the leader of my Bible study and I did not know her from Adam. And I just said, well, let's grab coffee and find out who we are. Like, let's grab coffee and, and I'd like to get to know you a little bit. That's great. And it so- was super awkward. In fact, she just told a story. Um, that friend just told a story recently to a group of people that we were hanging out with about how awkward that was. And it really? Was, oh yeah, it was. It was super awkward. It was, it was like the weirdest date, coffee date. Man. Maybe not. Oh well. We made through it. We made it through and now we're great friends. Yes, you did. That's great. So that's so there's a formal aspect to going and seeking allies for your marriage. But there's also an informal aspect. But the thing about the informal aspect aspect, and again you you nailed it, is you still have to be bold in gathering these people around you. You know, the other side of that, and, and this is a, a practical point um, that, that we're going to move into. So, so 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it's the last verse I want to point to specifically in this podcast. It says, Paul, it's Paul talking, and he's talking about resurrection uh, to, to the church in Corinth, but he's pointing them to a problem he's seeing recurring with them in that they seem to be allowing a lot of bad actors into their body who are warping their beliefs about things of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so he interjects in here, and it's interesting, he's actually quoting a, likely, quoting a a play that was, that was being run at the time, certainly in the, in the, the area around um, Asia Minor, but in, but definitely in Uh, Corinth at the time and basically he's quoting it and he says do not be deceived and then he quotes the play he says bad company ruins good morals and he's sort of making this point to the church in Corinth that it doesn't really matter how strong you are in your beliefs if you surround yourself with people who are opposed to those beliefs they're going to ruin those beliefs because they warp them over time Right. And probably we have heard some version of that saying, probably from our parents at some point when we were hanging around with somebody that that maybe we shouldn't have been hanging around with. But it's really not that different. But we, I'm sure all of us don't have to look far in in our past to see examples of people who believed one way and then the, quote, bad company ruined their good morals. Right. High school is a great example of that, like tons of kids in high school right right and so the the point is that we we need to be really careful about who we're surrounding our marriage with to fight with us in the trenches in this battle because there are people who inadvertently might be fighting for the enemy that are in our circle of friends and again but please don't misunderstand me i'm not saying hey, if you've got friends that don't believe about marriage the same way the Bible teaches, you shouldn't be friends with them. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when you have trouble in your marriage, don't go to that friend because they're fighting for the enemy, right? They're going to help you tear your marriage down. They're not going to help you build it up. And And we've we've seen that. Unfortunately, time and time again. We have. with, with Again, people who mean well, but they're just not on... They just don't stand on God's holiness in regards to marriage. And and so they're chirping in somebody's ear about, oh, you should do this and you deserve this and blah, blah, blah. And, and it ruins a marriage. You said something earlier that's, I think, a really important thing to just point out to folks that are listening. So <clears throat> when you called the mentor that you called, mm-hmm. you said you called her knowing she wasn't going to tell you what you wanted to hear. Right. This is what makes folks in our sphere of influence that do not believe in marriage the way God desires. It's what makes them so dangerous. Because oftentimes we know it, and when we're angry, what do we want to hear? Do we want to hear the truth, or do we want to be affirmed? Yeah, I want to be affirmed. That's right. Even if we're angry, maybe even righteously so, but we want to go right to the next to the next level, mm-hmm. right? This, this is a really fascinating thing. This is just a, a side tangent. 
we're I'm studying uh, Exodus right now along with my Bible study, and we read a portion of Exodus where God's giving Moses the law on restitution, right? And and it's a part of the Bible where He says, <clears throat> God, you know, God says, look, if someone takes an eye, then you take their eye. If they take your hand, then you take their hand. And we look at that and go, oh man, that's kind of vengeful, isn't it? But the 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 we all recognize this. Like, look, when uh, <clears throat> when you find out your spouse is cheating on you, oftentimes you don't want to cheat on him or her. You want to kill him or her, right? And this was sort of God's point in Exodus. There's this sense of justice that rises up, right? So someone's not paying attention and they pull in front of me in traffic and I almost hit them. That has zero damage to me. But this thing rises up in me where I want to pull their car over and beat the crap out of them. Well, that isn't, that's not just, that's just me getting angry, right? And that was God's point in Exodus is we're not going to be people that are going to do that, Mm -hmm. right? If someone takes your hand, you take their hand and that's it. Then it's over. And you're on now on equal footing, and that's the end. Right? And of course, Jesus changes this completely when Jesus comes down to earth. But the point is, is that even in the Old Testament, our God is a God of unemotional justice. Mm-hmm. Right? And so, for us, when we get righteously angry at what you were angry about with me when you called the person that you called... It would have been easy for you to go, well, I want to call someone that's going to be just as angry about this as as I am and say some really horrible things about Nathan. But what that person represented at that time was God's sense of unemotional truth and justice. Right? The truth of the matter is, here's how you should react. it's It's not saying your feelings aren't worthy of hearing no and she yeah and she validated me feeling the way i felt that's and, right which was important for me that's right time. but we don't then just go oh, well now it's just on right because because exactly. of all the anger and pain and all that so uh so we need to be we need to be careful about who we have surrounding us we need to be intentional about finding people to surround us if we don't currently have them well how do we tell the difference between the two right i mean i might have a whole lot of people around me but i don't necessarily know if those people i have around me are which camp they're in are they allies or are Mm -hmm. they enemies so how do we get to the bottom of that i mean these women that you have in your life and i would imagine there are probably plenty of women probably even plenty of women you met through the church or in similar circumstances that you would not go to if you and I were in sure. marital trouble. So how do you parse the difference between the two? Well, first you have to know about marriage for yourself. So sure. So why is that, sorry, why is that important? Why, why does that matter? Well, you have to know what the Bible says for yourself because you can't rely on what anybody else says. There are lots of lots of Bible believing churches that don't believe the same thing about marriage that we do. There's lots of Bible believing people in our own church that don't believe the same thing about marriage that we do. Right. So, so for example, if I were to say the Bible says that you can get divorced if, uh, in the case of infidelity or in the case of abuse, would you say there's a lot of people within church that would believe me if I said that? Yes. Do you believe that's true? No. How so? I believe that the Bible says you can get married or divorced because of infidelity. Right. It never says you can get divorced for abuse. Correct. By the way, it also does not say just please keep getting abused. That's a whole that's different... That's also correct. Whatever. Yep. That's but... a whole different topic. Anyway. Um, but, yes, it does say you can get... You can get divorced because of infidelity, but that's also not really what you should be doing. I mean, that's, right. that's never God's plan. Divorce was never God's plan from the beginning. He doesn't desire for you to get divorced, and infidelity is not a um, an automatic get check the box. 
he check you can check the box infidelity right. you can get divorced now right so so for sure and and the the abuse issue comes up a lot if you're dealing with any with with physical abuse in your home and there's any kind of fear for your safety or the safety of your kids you need to leave and right. get the police involved right now um, because that's super serious uh, so uh, we're we're not trivializing that at all but I have heard a lot of people say that you know abuse is one of the reasons that you can get divorced and that's just simply not in the bible um and nope. <clears throat> yeah what it's not it d- can we understand that not all the time right i mean that's that's the hard thing about about some things in the bible is that you can't really fully understand that why does god give an out or well, really moses but why is there an out in the bible for infidelity but not abuse i could give some reasons that i think but there just isn't one in the Bible, and that's hard for us to understand because abuse is also not acceptable to the Lord. Right. So, um, but we just have to trust in what we what we read and what's there. Right. The, and the, really, the reason infidelity is in there dates back to the early history of the Jewish people, really. And it was actually God's care for women that brought that about, and that's why Jesus said that wasn't the way God intended it. But it right. was because of the a, hardness and disobedience of the, right. of the Israelite and, people. And rights. the difference between, yeah, infidelity is a spiritual a spiritual act too. So anyway. Right. But but point is, if you don't know what the Bible says, then you can never know if someone's telling you the truth right. or not. Yep. We've heard a number of people that say, well, if there's infidelity, you should get divorced. That's what the Bible says. It's not what it says. No, it allows for divorce, but... But it's never a, our belief is that you should never get divorced. Um, and God really, his desire is, is that even, even if there's infidelity, that there would be restoration. Right. Because ultimately our, our marriage is a covenant relationship we have with God. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but the point is, you can never know the answer to these things. You know, anybody can tell you anything about marriage if you don't know for yourself. Even so stuff first that sounds and, good and sounds right. Right. So first and foremost, you got to know for yourself, right? Yep. Okay, so what about second? And then you have to talk with your family and your friends about marriage. Right. I mean, that's I would I would never know who I'd be able to these three people that I feel like I'm safe with in regards to divulging like deep marriage issues that we may have or, or whatever. I would never know that I could talk to them and get good counsel if I hadn't talked to them originally about marriage and what they believe and Right, now to be and watched their marriage play right. their marriages play out and how they handle their own marriage. Right. So now to be clear, you're not saying you started by just launching into your marriage. You're saying you started by talking to them about their belief about marriage right. generally. Yep. Right. Yeah, and I think that's really the only way we can do it. And you might you might listen to that and go, well, that's weird. I don't wouldn't talk to my friends about it's that. It's kind of come up um, naturally. But, but again, but yes. go back to the part where we talked about being bold. But also, it really shouldn't be that awkward to be able to sit down with our friends and go, what do you think about marriage? Especially if they're married, it's directly applicable to their right. lives. And it can come up kind of naturally, too. I'm not looking for... When I make a friend, I'm not looking for them to immediately become some deep-level person that I can go to with my marriage, you know? So this is like... I'm not... It's not like it's my second friend date with them, and I'm like... I Tell me all your views on marriage, because I need somebody in my circle. You know, it's it's over time sort of thing. It's part of the feeling out process. Yes, Nathan, it's part of the figuring them out process. Got it. Got <laughs> I'll it. say that. That's a better word. All right, so first and foremost, practically know what the Bible says about marriage. In that regard, shameless plug, season three of Marriage Monday is going to be us just going through the verses in the Bible that talk about marriage. We're going to hit as many of them as we can in the weeks that we get together um, and, and just talk about well, what does the Bible say about marriage, and we'll... Good, bad, and ugly, we'll take them as we cover them, and we'll probably cover some that don't directly deal with marriage, like the one from Ecclesiastes we just read. Right. They come I was gonna, up a lot with as regards yeah, to marriage. There are lots of verses in the Bible that, that can relate to marriage, but don't necessarily talk about marriage. So right. I'm sure we'll deal with a lot of those, too. Right. Like, wives submit to your husbands. 
like why we're start with that. We might we might take four or five weeks on that. Yes, let's go ahead. <laughs> now, so first and foremost, know about marriage for yourself. Second, talk with your family and friends about marriage so that you know whose side they're on in the event, not in the event, when the attacks come against your marriage. Because as we talked about in our last episode, they're going to come. Because your marriage, by design, is an affront to our common enemy. Because it points out God's ultimate victory and provision for human beings over Satan. Mm. So... Hopefully that helps, gives you something to think about uh, as a couple. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to answer those. You can put them in the comments section if you are listening or watching us on YouTube. Otherwise, if you are listening to us on any one of our podcasting partner platforms, love to have you like this podcast, leave us a review, feel free to jump over to uh, facebook.com. Uh, marriage by design podcast and leave us any questions or comments that you have there we respond to every comment and or question that we receive until next time guys remember god is for your marriage have a great week Hey, thanks for joining us on Marriage by Design. If you were impacted by this video, like it by hitting the thumbs up below. Also, don't forget to subscribe. And once you subscribe, hit the bell icon so you can be notified when new episodes release. Excellent. Also, one of the huge pillars of our show is interactivity between us and you. So we would love you to comment down in the comments below if you have thoughts about this video or if you have questions or other things you'd like to, like to see considered in the future. In addition, if you'd like, you can email us. That's marriagebydesignpodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Instagram at marriagebydesignpodcast, or you can find us on Facebook by searching Marriage by Design Podcast. Finally, if you want to, you can tweet at us. We do have a Twitter account. That is at marriagexdesign. Thanks, and have a great day.